Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, we're going to get um, Red Hat's John Klingon to give us a, an overview and explain exactly what OpenShift application runtimes are. Um, it's uh, it, the acronym I love. It's ROAR, but um, I think it needs a little bit of a, a deep dive and explanation, and I'm really happy that we have John with us today to do that. So um, the format is ask questions in the chat if you have them. Um, we'll open it up for live Q&A at the end of the presentation, but we're going to let John rock and roll here and um, introduce himself and his topic. So thanks, John. Take it away. All right. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation, and thanks for everyone uh, either attending or viewing after the fact. So uh, as, as Diane mentioned, I'm a product manager at Red Hat, and I am responsible for the uh, OpenShift application runtimes product. Um, this includes uh, just a quick uh, brief overview. Um, Node.js, uh, Wildfly Swarm, uh, Spring Boot uh, certification, as well as um, uh, Eclipse Vertex. And uh, I'll, I'll explain more a little bit uh, later as we go, th go throughout this uh, presentation. I am also um, uh, an active member of the uh, Eclipse MicroProfile project, which I'll also briefly describe during this uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the monolith to microservices trend, um, along with an overview of uh, microservices, talk about the evolution of microservices, as well as how um, the <clears throat> OpenShift itself and Kubernetes actually can offer um, quite a lot of value to microservice uh, developers, All right? And uh, talk about the actual product, OpenShift application runtimes with, if we have enough time, a quick demo, and then a little bit of a kind of a looking forward um, with uh, Roar as well. So uh, Red Hat OpenShift application runtimes is kind of shortened to the ROAR acronym. So if you if you hear me say ROAR, um, that's what that means. Okay, talk a little bit first about the monoliths to microservices trend. Um, what I, I think most organizations have in place uh, have been, you know, traditional Java EE application servers, right? And these run either Java EE applications or Spring applications. And the interesting thing about uh, Java EE application servers is that they actually, uh, you know, combined with an operations group, um, a lot of services that are available on behalf of the developer. Right, so with a developer, uh, as a developer, I can focus a lot of my business logic and not have to worry um, a lot about some of the supporting services that are available, um, you know, by an app server platform like uh, JBoss EAP. Examples include, you know, provisioning, um, high availability clustering, session replication, you know, functionalities like that. And uh, what's going on now, basically, in the industry is that software development is changing, right? The industry as a whole is moving from, you know, well, I don't think we've been waterfall for a while, but from agile methodologies to DevOps, from an infrastructure perspective, we've gone from bare metal to virtual machines to now cloud environments, whether it's public cloud, private cloud, or what's probably most prevalent is actually hybrid cloud, where you have a combination of both public and uh, private clouds. And uh, from an architecture perspective, developers ha have gone from developing monoliths, which are very easy to develop, right? I mean, there's a huge benefit to, to developing monoliths, to today where we actually have microservices. And the challenge to developers is all of this is happening, happening simultaneously. Right, they have potentially, you know, a, an architecture change, change monoliths to microservices, um, a cloud platform change, which may be perhaps virtual machines to now Docker containers, right? An underlying platform change, as well as, um, you know, changes around an application runtime, maybe as a part of moving to microservices. Uh, you're evaluating not just, you know, how does Java EE run in the cloud, but maybe I can get into reactive development. Um, you know, maybe I can look at Node.js, right? So all of these things are happening simultaneously, and the developer kind of has to, uh, you know, keep up with these uh, changes happening within an organization. And the way most organizations are approaching this is through kind of, you know, a, a smaller team, perhaps, 
um, architects or um, application leads kind of all collaborating to go off and evaluate cloud runtimes like OpenShift, right? That's why I think a lot of you are, are, are here. Um, uh, at cloud runtimes, application runtimes, and so on. But at some point, the rest of the organization is going to have to be brought on board and brought up to speed quickly. And in some some organizations I've spoken to, it's you know more than ten thousand developers, right? So the question becomes, how do I make those developers as productive as quickly as possible as they kind of move um, move through this software change? So. From an infrastructure perspective, right? Some of you may be familiar with the uh, the graphic to the left. That's actually one of the you know traditional OpenShift graphics, right? Where um, you know you have it, it's the architecture of OpenShift, where you have you know nodes. You know, you hit, first of all, you have a, a an OpenShift cluster, right? And in that cluster, you have nodes which can run containers and containerized applications that the developers in your organizations develop. Right, and what's interesting about this is it provides a lot of functionality on behalf of the developer. And um, what's interesting is that a lot of that functionality isn't necessarily being tapped into, which is kind of what Roar directly addresses. So from um, switching a little bit, and I'll get back to kind of how developers can leverage a lot of the functionality available in, in, in OpenShift, um, you know, there's, microservices itself, right? And there's a million different definitions of microservices, but generally speaking, what, what it is, is instead of a single monolithic application that includes many pieces of functionality, a microservice is just a, you know, a collection of small services that each individually own part of the business problem domain, and they all kind of collaborate to expose eventually a service out to the end user. And, um, these are each independently deployable, which means they can version at different rates. I don't have to, you know, wait for another part of the application to finish before I can actually, you know, provision a monolith. Right now, I can provision each each service independently. Right, and there's other um, uh, benefits I'll I'll be getting into. Um, but the main piece is is that it's indeploy independently deployable services. Right, it's no longer a single monolith, and um, Basically, the monolith is broken down into individual services using domain-driven design, typically. It, it fits the microservices model well. So I take a business capability, and I, I make that business capability uh, a service, right? And um, the, the, I, I think the most interesting pieces relative to microservices and the you know folks that are most likely watching this is the fact that we microservices right where you used to have one big monolith now you have many microservices you've kind of exploded the number of deployable artifacts right maybe you've gone to 20 within your organization to potentially 100 or 1000 right depending how you um, um, decompose your monolith and so what really helps in that um, situation is that you have fully automated software delivery stack Right, and that's where OpenShift comes in in a lot of ways because it makes provisioning services actually a lot easier and managing those services a lot easier. Provides a common in infrastructure um, for developers to deploy, to, you know, write to, as well as um, IT ops to kind of manage. And uh, the other thing is that you no longer, with, with a monolith, you're developing in one technology typically, right? Whether it's Java EE or Spring, maybe you're writing to a specific database, you know, an Oracle database or MySQL, and it's always that database within an organization. And what microservices enable is, is now multiple, um, multiple application runtimes. Each service that I have in my environment um, can potentially be running a different, um, application runtime is how we refer to them. So I mentioned some of them before, Node.js, Eclipse, um, Vertex, and, and, and so on. All right, so um, it provides developers a lot of autonomy, right? And I suspect within your organizations, you'll narrow it down to perhaps a, 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 a subset of what's possible <laughs> in the application realm, right? It's not gonna be a thousand different runtimes running in your environment, but you'll, you'll narrow it down most likely to two a subset of supportable things. And that's kind of what, what Roar is, is, is gonna be offering. Uh, the good things about uh, microservices, um, it's, it's basically uh, changes, 
you know, the way you approach developing applications. So agile software development, uh, I mentioned domain di driven design. There's now a common packaging model um, with a container format, right? So now it doesn't matter what the runtime is, the packaging format is always a container, right? You provision the container. And then in, the, in within OpenShift, you manage and operate those containers consistently across all the language runtimes. And full lifecycle automation, right? I kind of mentioned that. So there's a lot of really good things around um, microservices. Um, part of the issue with microservices, though, is that it trades off agility with um, operational complexity. So now with agility, I can actually deploy services independently and no longer does one team have to wait for another team. Each team can rev their services at the need of the business, right? Whatever that is, is required by the business for that service. The issue is now we've introduced a lot of complexity, right? There's m more things to manage. Um, there's the fact that I have many services um, in general and um, some of the things that were provided by the Java application server aren't necessarily there in a microservices environment, and I'll touch on some of those. And this complexity means that it can be tougher to bring or onboard the rest of the organization onto a microservices and kind of cloud platform, right? Um, and I, I, I touched on that. So, you know, the really, the really ugly piece of it is that building large-scale distributed applications uh, or distributed systems is really, really hard. Right, because with a monolith, you may perhaps find yourself having created some spaghetti code, perhaps within a monolith, but at least you don't have a network in between um, service calls within a monolith. If you don't design your 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 microservices properly and the boundaries between your microservices, now what you've done is you've also introduced um, a network, right, which increases the latency significantly. So many more pieces um, to, to be uh, that have to get involved. You know, many microservices, getting them all to interoperate. And there's issues like how does one service locate another service? How do I configure that service right in a way that isn't tied specifically to that service? These are things that were kind of inherent in monoliths with Java EE that now we have to go off and solve in the microservices world, right? So. You know, microservices recommendations, I, I think the first thing is to think about what applications actually require microservices. Because if you find yourself in the situation where you have these monoliths um, in, your, in your organization and they're working well, um, then maybe you don't need to actually convert them into microservices, right? Just perhaps you can rehost them um, in a container, uh, which JBoss EAP does very, very well. Um, you could rehost your monoliths in 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 uh, in a container running on OpenShift, and you still benefit from some of the operational aspects of um, you know a cloud platform. But um, you know, as as soon as as you begin de decomposing some of your more complex application into monoliths, I think the first thing is, can you decompose it in the context of the monolith? Right. Um, so Martin Fowler, um, there's a great blog entry he has on Monolith First. Make sure you, make sure that you've defined your service boundaries properly within the context of um, a monolith before you go off and separate these out into multiple services running in your environment. Right. So that's kind of a a, um, a recommendation that I have if you want to decompose. Right. Uh, if, if you want to start from a greenfield application, right, a brand new application, which is a strategy that a lot of organizations are taking, start small um, and, and and grow from there. Don't pick real complex um, services or, or applications first. Right. Um, choose the simpler ones. Gain some experience. Uh, make sure that you have your domain model properly modeled um, before you go off and do it. Right. And of course, Red Hat can help with the Red Hat Innovations Labs as well. Right, so a little bit here on the evolution of of uh, microservices. Um, uh, beginning around 2014, um, uh, microservices became uh, started becoming quite popular. Right, the idea of microservices, uh, the roots of it um, reach back before 2014. Right, but I, I think where we really, you know, organizations really started to uh, evaluate them more seriously beyond just kind of the absolute bleeding edge companies started right around 2014. 
And the interesting thing is when you're developing business logic, right, and now underneath you, what you have is just pure infrastructure as a service, right? So, you know, it's, it's an AMI with just an operating system, right, or a container with just RHEL, for example. Um, what you're missing is a lot of those services that were available to you from a Java EE application server, right? Um, and even when I talk about Java EE, it could be .NET or some other kind of you know, more complete platform that was really good at running monolith, uh, monolithic applications. Um, a lot of those services are no longer there, which means you have to go out and replace them with something. And so what we kind of did in the 2014 um, era um, as an industry is we defined or created our services, um, these, some of these services that actually ran on top of this infrastructure right infrastructure as a service so some of these managed services might be um, a service registry right so that one service can register with a service registry so all the other services that need to use that service can find it right so you need to be able to register and discover services within your microservice environment so the idea of a service registry which has been there in computing for a long time but in terms of microservices right it's a it's definitely a very uh, it's definitely a required component. And things like, you know, configuration server, how do I externalize my configuration? Um, I no longer have state management with session replication like I did with Java EE, which means now I have to have um, basically a data store, some kind of, of caching system to actually store some session data um, uh, between requests, right? So these are things to think about. And we've even as an industry kind of polluted some of our business logic with these infrastructure type concerns. So if you think about um, how do I deal with, um, if, I need, if I call a service and that's so long, that service is, isn't available, how do, I, how do I deal with that failure situation? That's where things like circuit breakers, bulkheads, these programming patterns, you know, many people think of Hystrix um, from, from the Netflix OSS stack as an example of that, right? So now I've I've kind of baked into my application this notion of you know services come services go or or they're available and not available I I should say, and um, you know there's many examples of that within a microservice. So these red bubbles kind of uh, or red dots kind of represent you know the supporting services that I have to have, and the yellow dots are kind of things that have been infrastructure concerns that have been kind of dealt with at the application layer. Right. So if, if we kind of think about OpenShift, um, not just as an operations platform, um, but as a platform that can be leveraged by the developer, there's a lot of services available in OpenShift and Kubernetes, right, by um, by natural association that can be leveraged by a developer. So we've got service discovery. Uh, perhaps we could just use DNS, right? Because Kubernetes, as I create new services, um, that service has um, a DNS name represented um, by that, right? And as I create many instances of that um, instant, many instances of that service, uh, those IP addresses are automatically added and removed from, you know, from DNS, but I also get the benefit of load balancing. Right, these are things, both things um, that can help replace, you know, monolithic architectures um, with microservices running on top of a Kubernetes environment. Those really help. Um, auto scaling, scale up, scale down. Um, Java EE application servers often offered that functionality, and now that is kind of being replaced by uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. Rolling upgrades become much more straightforward um, operationally. Um, across runtimes, not just Java EE, but any runtime um, that you choose to develop with can now benefit from these features in um, in, in, in OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, now getting to um, some other interesting things that can actually impact an actual application and how I write it um, is externalized configuration. Um, so instead of having a configuration service that kind of you know, where I store configuration state, you know, maybe it was a database, maybe it's it's some other um, service, you know, Arceus or, or whatever, right, that can actually store properties, uh, not Arceus, I apologize, but, but, but Eureka, um, you know, store properties as well, maybe I can externalize some of that configuration, right? 
Um, well, the interesting thing is Kubernetes has built into it the idea of config config maps, where I can store a configuration um, inside Kubernetes itself. So why not just use the features that are available in Kubernetes instead of relying on this other service that I actually have to go out, you know, go and manage myself, right? Uh, if I have to create an instance of something, then I have to manage that thing. Um, also, the idea of uh, credential store, instead of having a vault, uh, as a separate process to store secrets. Maybe what I could do is just use the inherit secrets capability um, built into Kubernetes as well. And getting a little bit further, instead of using you know, uh, con these configuration strings, let's say to connect to a database and storing that in um, a configuration service, uh, maybe we can use the actual, you know, use the service broker Right, that is now um, I think Tech Preview in uh, in OpenShift, which is a three three point six as of this recording. But I think it's in three seven. It'll be out of Tech Preview if I recall correctly. Right, but the idea of service binding is um, I I can basically bind to a broker, and that broker can provide to me all of the credentials that are uh, required to connect to a database, and maybe even um, instantiate the database as well. Right, if one isn't already running. So there's lots of interesting things that are showing up in Kubernetes that are directly um, impactful in a positive way to developers, right? These are just some examples and there's, and, and there's more, right? So if we think about developing applications now, what I've done on this slide is I've kind of added container platform services provided by OpenShift, right? And, and maybe now what I can do is, is push down into, um, push out of my business logic and into the underlying infrastructure, some of the capabilities, um, you know, that are provided by um, OpenShift. So, um, you know, one example could be config map, right? And storing a, a service configuration in, inside of Kubernetes itself. And what used to be a uh, uh, something stored in, in, in my business logic, maybe that's something now that becomes uh, a supporting service, something that's a higher value service um, running in, in, in my environment, right? So what I'm doing is I'm pushing some of these concerns out of my actual business logic and into the stacks below, um, below the business logic, right? So the question then becomes, how can the application runtimes actually take advantage of all this stuff? you know, stuff that's been baked, you know, pushed down into the underlying um, container runtimes, for example. And that's where the OpenShift application runtimes come in, right? And you can see here um, what, what, what some of these are. Um, I mentioned Vertex, Wildfly Swarm, um, Spring Boot in terms of certification, and then Node.js. And we also have, um, JBoss EAP7 we're planning to include in this product. It's not released yet. Um, it's actually in an uh, in early beta, and I'll discuss that here um, shortly. And with JBoss EAP included in the SKU, uh, I can basically first create my applications using, um, you know, begin decomposing my applications in the context of the monolith. Remember I was mentioning that, don't go straight from you know, a, what, what could be a spaghetti code monolith into a microservice, first solve the problem in the context of the monolith, right? And having JBoss EAP included in this queue lets you do that, right? And we even have this concept called the majestic monolith. There's some organizations out there that are able to deliver, um, you know, weekly releases of their applications running in a monolith on top of, for example, an application server, right? There are customers doing that. And if you think that weekly releases of your service are frequent enough um, for your business, then it may be actually simpler just to leave it in the context of an application server, right? But, it, but if you decide to move to microservices, first try and solve the problem, um, in the context of an application server and then decompose it out, out into microservices, right? All right, um, so simplifying deployment on OpenShift. So what, Open, what, what Roar offers is basically the application runtimes and support for the actual application runtimes. So support for EAP, support for uh, Vertex, support for Wildfly Swarm, uh, at the moment, we're just certifying Spring Boot, um, but we'd, we'd look to uh, look forward to feedback if you'd like to us to go further. And Node.js is in Tech Preview, 
right? Um, so in the first release, it, it won't be fully supported, but we're we're definitely working on full support for, for Node.js as well. Uh, and what we want to do for each of those runtimes is create the bindings to the uh, to those Kubernetes features, um, so that uh, it simplifies the the development experience for developers. Right, so they don't have to know all the ins and outs of Kubernetes to actually leverage the features that are in Kubernetes. Right, so um, that's partly what it offers. Um, we're going to extend that not just to uh, the features in Kubernetes, but also add on, um, you know, JBoss middleware services. And I'll, I'll explain that. Well, I'll, I'll just cover it a little bit here. Um, think about JBoss Data Grid. Right, if if you need either a a uh, a, a data store to store your session information be between requests. You could use J JBoss Data Grid for that, or you could deploy an entire data grid, right? If you need many services and a very, you know, in a distributed data cache, right? For complex scenarios, um, we want to develop with Roar, making that experience of using any one of these runtimes with that data grid very natural um, for that runtime. Right, and so we're extending beyond just Kubernetes into our application runtimes, all running on top of OpenShift. Right, um, documentation examples. So we'll have documentation um, and examples around the bindings and the simplification that we've done, uh, as well as some tooling I'll, I'll, I'll cover, and a totally awesome getting started experience, which I hope to demo um, if I have time. All right, so Vertex, just to explain a little bit about some of the runtimes uh, that we uh, actually you know, support or certify. So Vertex, uh, think of Vertex, um, it's an Eclipse project, and it started in 2012 kind of as, as a way um, to do what Node.js does for JavaScript, um, reactive development, asynchronous development, doing it on the JVM. Right, so Vertex um, basically takes the, a similar approach to Node.js, but on the Java Virtual Machine, and it's uh, it's really good at high concurrency, low latency applications. Um, it, it excels at that. Right, so if you have a high concurrency, low latency application that you know you you think you know you might need you know, to develop it in a reactive style or an asynchronous development kind of style, but you still want to use your Java expertise, go ahead and do that. Right, it is polyglot in, in that you can use many language, uh, many language, many languages to develop Vertex applications. But all we're supporting um, today is the Java language binding. Right, so um, that was a kind of a, a really quick overview of of, of Vertex. If this sounds interesting, um, there's a couple of books uh, that will kind of introduce you into Vertex. Uh, Ver Developing asynchronous or reactive style applications for the JVM, for Java, these books are a really good place to start. Just go to vertex.io slash docs, okay? Uh, Wildfly Swarm is the next uh, runtime. So many of you have probably heard of Wildfly. It's a Java EE application server um, that's up, uh, upstream, uh, led by Red Hat. And Red Hat productizes that as the JBoss Enterprise Applications Server. And um, Swarm basically leverages uh, Wildfly, the upstream application server, right? Um, and some of the Java EE technologies, not all of Java EE, right? The, the, the technologies that are relevant to creating microservices, right? So we combine that with micro profile technologies which i'll describe shortly but briefly here micro micro profile is all about bringing microservices patterns and frameworks to the you know java ee ecosystem right so it combines that with micro profile and um those open shift bindings that i mentioned right so we kind of combine all these things and we have wildfly swarm so you can create embeddable you know fat jars if you don't want to do um, you know, a traditional app server kind of scenario, but you really want uh, Uber jars and develop using that methodology, you can do that with Wildfly Swarm. It's very light, lightweight, um, it's, extens uh, it's, it's extensible, which means we can add capabilities um, very easily. Um, both Vertex and Swarm, I should mention, have those bindings that I mentioned to OpenShift, but it's also interesting in that they're both um, uh, they're both just, at the end of the day, Maven artifacts that are available in the Red Hat Maven 
um, repo for for the productized pieces and upstream in you know Maven Central for the uh, upstream artifacts, which means there's no runtime that you actually deploy to. You just build your application by creating in the Maven world a palm file, right, with with your proper dependencies on the right artifacts for the runtime, and you build it and you get an, an Uber jar, right? Uh, really cool stuff. But our our Uber jar approach for Wild, Wildfly Swarm is still based on um, the JBoss modules. It's just packaged differently um, as as an Uber jar, right? Um, so MicroProfile is a project that Red Hat co-founded uh, along with IBM, Pyara, Tommy Tribe, um, the London Java community, and many others have joined. Um, you can go to microprofile.io to kind of learn more about MicroProfile. But the idea is that we are bringing microservice patterns uh, to Java EE developers, right? So, you know, Java EE was a little bit slow in in as a mature platform in kind of um, moving forward, right? It was mature, had the functionality that was required by a lot of, um, you know, traditional applications. But now with the uptick of microservices, what we wanted to do was, was kind of innovate more rapidly in an open source project. So MicroProfile is actually um, an Eclipse project. And we're all collaborating there on MicroProfile specifications. There's multiple implementations of these things. Think circuit breakers, think externalized configuration, health checks, monitoring. These are all things that are available in what is just released, uh, MicroProfile 1.2, right? So MicroProfile.io, take a look. And Wildfly Swarm is our implementation vehicle for the microprofile specifications that I just mentioned, right? So I'm one of the co-leads. Um, IBM is another co-lead currently, right? That someday that may change, right? As as um, you know, it's, it's just an open source community. But but for now, that's where things are. And there's committers from across many companies, but also individuals not associated with companies. So if you want to help bring microservices to Java EE, go to microprofile.io. There's a Google group as well where we where we kind of hang out and have the discussions and join any one of those, right? And and participate if you're interested in, in this uh, project, in this concept, right? All right, there's also a book in the making on Wildfly Swarm. Um, I created a bit.ly link, otherwise it'd be kind of long. It's just bit.ly slash enterprise Java microservices book that you see there in the in the bottom of this slide, right? Um, it's scheduled, I think, for later this year, um, but it kind of provides you um, some, some uh, idea of how we're lever how we're creating allowing you to create microservices um, with Java EE technologies um, you know along with 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 openshift as well right so um, definitely take a look if you're interested all right um, Node.js, uh, a large uh, it's a large and vibrant community I suspect most of the people on this call know what Java uh, Java <laughs> sorry Node.js is right typically it's con it's pr considered uh, Java server-side JavaScript, right? So there's a tremendous amount of JavaScript expertise in the industry. A lot of it has to do with traditional um, development of JavaScript in the browser. And some just want end-to-end -end JavaScript, right? JavaScript in the uh, browser, but also JavaScript on the server side. Where it tends to fit really well in our enterprise architectures is kind of that touch point, right? A client JavaScript application does really well talking to a, uh, a Node.js server. And often that Node.js service uh, which kind of acts as a gateway um, to all these backend services that may be written in who knows whatever language, right? So architecturally, that's where it tends to fit the most in enterprises. Um, Roar, as I mentioned, is going to have a tech preview of this at, at GA, and uh, eventually we're going to actually be supporting Node.js itself. And just to give you an idea here, Red Hat is a Node.js Foundation member. And um, so the Node Foundation is is Node JS Foundation is where um, Node JS itself evolves as as a platform, right? Red Hat is a platinum sponsor, and we also have Node JS committers, right? In fact, we have Node JS committers on all the um, projects I've mentioned so far, and we even kind of you know lead the Eclipse Vertex, and we uh, lead Wildfly Swarm as well, right? <laughs> In my rush to get the slides done in time, I forgot to mention or or add, I think, a, uh, yeah, I forgot to add a Spring Boot slide. So what we're doing is, is we're uh, uh, 
certifying, uh, testing and verifying Spring Boot on top of OpenShift, right? So that means, John, yes. I'm just gonna interrupt for a couple, there's a couple of questions about Spring Boot now that you're talking about it that might be good to yes. answer. Now. Um, about what is the Spring Boot implementation? Is it using something like Tomcat as a servlet container or is it from Fabric 8? And um, a lot of folks are asking about um, Spring Boot support if that's on the roadmap. Yes, in, in fact, the more comments and feedback I get in the uh, chat on this, the better. And I apologize, since I'm full screen, I can't see the chat. Um, so we we are, as a, in terms of just a, a servlet container, from a servlet container perspective, um, if you're using, you know, obviously upstream Spring Boot, you're just using an upstream uh, Tomcat container. In terms of product, what we're what we've done. Uh, in case you didn't know, we have something called the JBoss Web Server, which a pro which is a productization of the Apache HTTP server and Apache Tomcat, right? So, um, what we've done uh, is we've worked with the JBoss Web Server team, who has Tomcat committers. I I, I should mention um, in this context, um, we've worked with the team to create a supported embedded Tomcat container. Right, so if you're running uh, a Spring Boot application on top of you know, OpenShift as a part of Roar, we actually support the embedded Tomcat container. Right, there's been some interest as well for us to kind of have a, a standalone productized build of Undertow, which is the servlet engine used by both uh, JBoss EAP uh, and, and its Wildfly um, upstream equivalent, and it's also used in Wildfly Swarm. Right, so I'd be interested in understanding if people would also be interested in having Undertow as an actual product option. Right, we just started off with uh, with with Tomcat, so that answers that question. Um, other things we've done around Spring Boot is we've uh, tested and verified uh, something like around 10 plus um, uh, Spring Boot starters. Right, so if you go to start.spring.io and you look at some of the examples there, they're backed by starters. And we've we've tested a bunch of starters. We've tested running applications, and I'll show you um, in a demo um, the fact that you can use uh, Spring Boot, right, um, to, to run um, on top of OpenShift using some of this. Another important piece to Spring Boot is something called the Fabricate Maven plugin. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the Fabricate uh, Kubernetes uh, Spring Cloud Kubernetes. I'll start with that. Spring Cloud Kubernetes basically is that binding I've mentioned, that glue that lets you develop Spring Boot applications in a very Spring Boot natural way, right? Think about Spring Boot to a large degree as, as an, annotations that allow you to inject things into your application, right? It abstracts away things like, um, you know, where does my configuration come from? How do I register and discover ser my service and discover other services, right? Those things are all injected in. And the way we do it with Spring Cloud Kubernetes is we, it's, it's just something that you add to your Palm file, right? And you, and you add Spring Cloud Kubernetes to your Palm file, and then it'll use the Kubernetes binding equivalents. So um, to do um, service configuration, it'll actually use config map. Right to do service registration and discovery, it'll use Kubernetes. Under the hood, um, what that does is it'll use kubeping to find all the instances of a service um, and actually use that to populate ribbon if you're using ribbon in client-side load balancing, right? But the important thing is that you're not changing any of your application code to do that, right? So, um, so we're trying to make it as natural for Spring Boot developers to develop on top of OpenShift, and that's true of all the language runtimes I've mentioned, right? Um, the other piece is, in fact, I think it's the next slide, um, so I'll, I'll go to this, is tooling. And this is true for all the runtimes. Um, so, well, with, 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 with an exception here. Okay, so for Java-based applications uh, that create Uber jars, so that's Spring Boot, Wildfly Swarm, and Vertex, we have something called the Fabricate Maven plugin. And this is an upstream, it's, it's still an upstream project, but um, what that does is it basically lets you take uh, an application that you've written, an Uber jar, and build and deploy it on OpenShift, right? So you don't have to worry about Docker files to, to a large degree, you don't have to worry about OpenShift templates. If I'm a Java developer that's just been used to creating a WAR file, 
and deploying it on top of an application server. That's kind of what the Fabricate Maven plugin does, right? It just says, um, you know, here's my app. Um, I add something to my palm file again. I say Maver uh, uh, Maven Fabricate colon deploy, and then I could tell it, you know, deploy to OpenShift. Um, it'll actually deploy to OpenShift, right? And that makes it just feel like an app server. Right, it makes OpenShift to a large degree just feel like a tradi traditional application server, although it's not. Right, um, as we I, I think all know here. <laughs> um, so uh, we, when we started towards productization of Node, we've also created something called Node Shift. It does something very similar to what the Fabricate Maven plugin does, but for Node applications. Now, Node doesn't quite have the build cycle, right, um, that Java applications do. But what Node Shift does is it basically takes care of the deployment cycle, right? So again, creation of the Docker image, actually deploying it on top of OpenShift. Um, that's something that we've done upstream. Um, there's an upstream project called Bucharest Gold um, in, uh, in, in GitHub and uh, in, um, I believe that's also in the, uh, sorry, um, Docker Hub as well, images. So it's it's all upstream, Bucharest Gold, and it's basically our efforts around Node.js at Red Hat, right? So it includes Node Shift, for example. Um, and it'll also include the bindings that I mentioned. Any binding work that we do to the Kubernetes features will happen through Bucharest Gold, right? So Node Shift, I could just develop like it's a local application, and then when I'm ready, deploy it to uh, deploy it to OpenShift using Node Shift. Again, I don't have to worry about Docker. I don't have to worry about OpenShift templates, right, as a developer. Um, the online environment. So the tooling around the iron, iron, the online environment. Uh, we mostly rely on Java S two I um, with the tooling that's specifically kind of geared around just Roar, right? So I'm going to show you a demo, and what this demo is going to do is use Java S two I, right, to actually provision applications, generate an application, and provision it um, to OpenShift, right? Red Hat as a company is also working on something called OpenShift.io. And OpenShift.io is basically an entire developer experience, right, around, um, you know, enterprise development. So while it's like an online IDE, right, where you can edit your code, build your code, test and debug your code all online, um, it also has, you know, some, some team planning features. It has a really neat feature called, um, uh, called uh, analytics that basically analyzes the code you're writing and the stack you're using and provides recommendations like, hey, you're using the, you know versions of certain plugins that's not very common. Most people are using this combination, right? Which might be different versions of plugins. Um, you know, the ideas could also see, hey, there's a CVE, uh, a critical vulnerability, um, security vulnerability in this version of this plugin that you're using. Maybe you should use this, this updated one, right? So the idea is that over time, as more people use OpenShift IO, it'll, it'll get smarter and smarter around these type, types of analytics. Right, and really help the developer become more productive. Um, so um, we're making sure that um, the code that we generate through this demo I'm going to show you, what we call, which we call launch, is actually compatible with with OpenShift IO. OpenShift IO right now is because you know it's a huge demand, a huge interest. We're still trying to scale it up, so not everybody can get on today, right? But go go feel to uh, feel free to register today to OpenShift.io. There's a URL. And you can register, kind of get on the list, and you'll be notified when they've scaled up enough capacity to actually add uh, add new developers. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and show the demo now. Okay. Um, I am going to show. Let's see. Can you can you see this, Diane? Yes, I can. Looks great. All right. It's the OpenShift console. Okay. Always. So what great. I've done. Um, okay. Is I've actually, I'm actually running this launch um, experience, I guess, this launch tool in Minishift on my desktop, which which anybody can do, right? It will also be available as an online service so that you don't have to do that if you don't want to, right? It'll be available so that you can actually, um, here, I'll, I'll just go through it and explain it, and then I'll, I'll explain more about uh, as I go along. Right, so this is basically lets you um, build and deploy some example applications that, that we have. So if you think about 
like what we do with JBoss EAP today, um, you know, if you want to get started quickly, we have a getting started page and there's a set of steps that you can go download JBoss EAP, clone a repository of examples, build the examples, deploy it to, you know, deploy it to EAP. And that's true of a lot of Red Hat products. And what we're trying to do is actually simplify that to just a wizard, right? Where the runtimes are all available online, right? I mentioned it's mostly Maven repositories, uh, uh, Maven artifacts, or in the case of Node, it's a, it's a container image. And the deployment environment could be OpenShift Online, whether it's OpenShift Online Starter, which is a free account, right, that you can sign up for and try this with here shortly, or OpenShift Online Pro, right? That's uh, kind of much more open, much more, uh, you know, many more resources available for developers to actually develop their applications. So um, these are the supported runtimes um, that I mentioned with launch. Um, so if you want to launch your project, uh, you, you, you click the launch, um, button and I can do a couple of things here. I can either, um, and we have to kind of know this ahead of time. Do I want to build and run locally? So if you think, for, since there's some people familiar with Spring, if you think about start.spring.io, right, you can build a, you know, um, a, a quick Maven project and then you download it locally and run it, you know, as a zip file and then you unzip it and you've got your project ready to go. You can do something very similarly by, by building and running locally. The only difference is that it's actually a full working example with um, you know, a database and um, health check and all this kind of stuff. It's we have very specifically defined use cases that we implement. And um, you can actually download and run them locally and run them in, in and then provision them to OpenShift um, online or in MiniShift if you want to run OpenShift on your desktop, right? Um, the other thing you can do is actually use it with OpenShift online. So pretty shortly here, when we go um, public beta, what you'll see is a list of clusters, right? Do I want to do online, uh, OpenShift starter online, OpenShift, uh, sorry, do I want to do OpenShift Online Starter, or do I want to deploy it to my OpenShift uh, Online Pro account, right? Um, or, uh, you know, you'll be able to choose between which online account you want to provision these examples to. Um, since I'm running in MiniShift, uh, open, again, that's OpenShift on my desktop, we're going to provision that to MiniShift running, uh, running locally. And that's pretty obvious here through the 192.168 URL, right? All right, now I, I select the mission kind of staying it's it's a launch themed um experience right so launch is kind of the the overall experience mission is basically a use case do i want to uh you know provision a database and an and an, a sample application and show how i can have the sample application use uh that database all running in openshift right we have a circuit breaking example externalized configuration with config map health check uh, a simple rest endpoint um, that's just basically hello world if you want to start out really simple. And we're even working on one that'll actually secure an endpoint with, with Red Hat SSO. Um, initially, some of these boosters, like the Red Hat SSO one, take more manual steps, but over time we hope to remove those manual steps, right? As we think about things like the service broker, right? Maybe we can uh, remove some of these manual steps and replace them with automated steps. All right, but, but um, many of these are actually just fully automated. All right, so what I can do is I'm going to choose health check. Um, I'm going to click next. Now, um, which runtime do I want to do a health check with? All right, um, I'm going to choose Vertex just because I, I tried this earlier. I just picked a random one. Um, you'll be able to use any one of these, right? Um, since I tested earlier with Vertex, I'm just going to use Vertex now. OK. Um, now I got to name the project, right? Because what's going to happen is it's going to actually take this project and fork it to my personal GitHub account, right? So there is some setup um, initially, uh, the first time you use this, um, to set up kind of the bindings um, to your OpenShift Online starter account or your pro account and GitHub, right? It's a one-time thing. Um, initially, there'll be some manual steps. We already know we, we, we have a path to get you to just clicking a, a couple of check boxes, right? Um, to, to get you there, right? With webhooks and everything set up. So a webhook in, in uh, GitHub basically means whenever an application changes, then I can actually reprovision that application and redeploy it on top of OpenShift, right? So um, OpenShift project name, I'm gonna call this vertex-openshift-commons-briefing, OCB, right? 
and okay, I'll just it just inserts. I think uh, I think it might be the username here. Um, Jay Klingen. Uh, I'll just hit next. Okay. Now it's going to give me an overview. It's saying I'm going to do kind of continuous delivery. Well, build and deploy through Java S2I. I chose the health check with Eclipse Vertex, and you know, you know here's a Vertex repository that's going to be created, and so on and so forth, along with the Maven artifacts, which you can change. Um, I just didn't select that. And now it's going to launch. And again, here it's going to launch to um, OpenShift running on my desktop in mini shift. So now it's actually forking the project to my GitHub. Um, it's going to um, actually push the code into the repo um, and then create the project on OpenShift Online, which again, in this case is running on my desktop um, and set up a build pipeline, which is for now Java S2I. Um, what the way th this kind of works is if this launch experience I'm showing here is mainly around Java S2I, but if you want to start using Jenkins pipelines and, and get more complex de um, deployment scenarios like blue green and and uh, AB kind of testing, that's where OpenShift IO comes in, right? So what you would do is you would take this project and import it into your OpenShift IO um, account and just kind of continue on from there. This is just a, a really quick getting started experience. So if if I want here, I can go to GitHub um, dot com slash jklingon. Let's go to my GitHub account real quick and show you that it's actually been created. Wow, my, sorry, my CPU is pegged here as it's going off deploying things. Okay. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> maybe what I'll do here is pull up open uh, mini shift and what you'll see here i've actually tried this earlier today with node I I, i've tried it with vertex these are actually actually already both running uh, inside of mini shift here and this is the one i just created right anonymous vertex ocb and what you'll see is it's actually deploying right now right so down here um i know it's probably small on your screen i can view the full log it's kind of downloading the internet right now right to do a maven build so uh the first time that you actually go off and build this that's kind of the typical Maven thing that it has to do, right? Um, maybe what I'll do in the interest of time is show you, sorry, I meant to hit home. I'll just show you, um, uh, maybe I'll show you the node example. Um, and here is the external route for the node application. It's the same health check one th that I mentioned. And it's the same flow for all the run times, right? So there's consistency across these, these uh, across the use case, across all the uh, the actual runtimes. So, so if I want to say uh, hello OCB, open shift, commons briefing. Okay, yeah, I got them in the right order. Hello OCB, and I got to work with our user experience, not, our developers. Kill me is probably not the best button. I, I think stop service might be a better name for it. And so I'm going to show show you something here. So. Um, when we deployed this, what's going on is it's actually setting up um, an, an OpenShift um, um, health check for this service, right? So if I if I click the the red button um, to stop the service, what you'll see is at some point, I think we have a, a two or five second kind of um, check. You'll see that it actually is restarting the service now. It went down, and so it's restarting it, right? And um, if I go here and I try and invoke it, you'll see, uh, oh, it's probably back up and running already. Yeah. Um, I can say hello test, it's actually up and running again, right? So what I can do is I can use this um, get a starting experience to actually run these examples online, check out the code, see the OpenShift bindings, as long as the bindings that we're adding to other Red Hat middleware. And I mentioned um, Red Hat SSO is one of the ones that we're kind of targeting first to secure an endpoint, but this will grow beyond that, right? All right, so that's a, just a really quick demo. Um, and we're gonna be announcing this very shortly um, in terms of letting you do this um, on your desktop um, so using the latest iteration, yeah. Well, just to, to iterate, the, the launcher that you just showed, um, someone was asking about it, and then they, I think they found it in um, in GitHub. But is that available for folks to use and to extend and fork? It will be available very, very shortly. Um, the the redirect, and the, it's not set up uh, installed yet, but very shortly, if you go to developers.redhat.com slash launch, right? 
that's going to be uh, where it's going to be set up, okay. right? And imminent is the word I'll use. Imminent. Oh, by the way, Java one's coming up next week, coincidentally. Coincidentally, so, I love how we're very event driven. Um, some yes. of us. Yeah, no, well, I've great. talked about domain-driven design. I often say the way we often develop, vendors in general develop products is conference-driven design, right? <laughs> we're, always, we're, we're always targeting conferences. So, um, all right, uh, a couple of quick closing slides, and I apologize. This is, um, no, no, this is kind of going along. Yeah, but uh, looking ahead um, in terms of where we're going, um, I suspect many of the folks here in the OpenShift Commons, you know, attending these briefings are, have heard of Istio. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Istio is that um, what I can do is when I deploy a service in a pod, what I can do is deploy with every service a sidecar, right, container. And that sidecar container provides a set of services. Right, so if I have a hundred services running microservices in my environment, every one of those services has the sidecar, and this side, these sidecars can basically all be connected to each other, um, which is what we call a service mesh. Right now, once I have that mesh in place, I can do some really interesting things. I can do intelligent um, routing. Right, I can do routing within the mesh. I can do um, a B testing uh, through the mesh. I can do um, um, uh, all sorts of interesting things via the mesh. I could do distributed tracing service to service within the mesh and not even bake that into my application as well, right? If I don't want to, right? The mesh can, can tell me what's the time to get, to get from, you know, service one to service two, right? And that is actually quite exciting, right? Um, being able to to do this, and what Istio does, in addition to these sidecar containers, it has it, it has kind of this control plane above it, right? Where I can define my policy um, centrally, and that policy gets pushed down into the mesh, right? So um, so I have some level of, of of control and centralization and consistency within my environment, right? Really cool stuff. Istio.io um, uh, is, I, I think, the website. But just Google Istio, right? You'll find it. Red Hat is very interested. We're we're active in the Istio community. Um, it's it's early days, right? It was just publicly announced this just this past May, right, of of, of 2017. So very early days. Um, but we're definitely interested in in trying to to bring this to OpenShift customers, right? Uh, the when and stuff is probably somebody else within Red Hat to, to better answer that. So now if I think about this in the, in the context of the evolution of microservices, Istio offers a, a collection of, of services that now even let me remove even more of this infrastructure concern out of my business logic and into the underlying platform, right? So the idea is if you think about circuit breaking, maybe I can remove that out of my um, application and have that in the service mesh. Maybe with the distributed tracing, if I don't need to actually trace into a container and get you know, um, tracing within my actual business logic uh, from one service all the way to the business logic of another service, then if and all I want is service to service tracing, then I could just use Istio for that. Right, so eventually we'll, we'll have um, you know kind of this end-to-end -end tracing um, through Istio. Now we're also doing work with Jaeger in in the um, uh, well, within Red Hat, which has recently joined the CNCF, and Jaeger lets you do distributed tracing, um, not just point to point, but also into the container. Right, so what we're doing there is um, OpenShift application runtimes is working with the Jaeger team to kind of enable tracing into the container um, for those that actually want to do that. As well as, you know, how do I visualize tracing? How do I store tracing? You know, so I can go back and, and, and review some of this tracing information. That's stuff that I don't think Istio covers, but we're looking at, at tackling it at, uh, at Red Hat, right? So these are things that we're kind of interested in and, and working on, right? There's, there's a this is a previous uh, briefing on on Jaeger and on open tracing and distributed tracing too. So there's a lot more coming in that way. Yes, actually, very good point. Yeah, I actually watched that one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, 
yeah, great stuff. Um, and last, I think this is the last slide. Public beta is imminent. Uh, GA for ROAR, um, which means support for the runtimes and you know all the glue work and the documentation and examples, is targeted for this calendar year. Um, we hope to have more um, online examples and uh, at launch. So you saw those use cases defined on that screen. Uh, we hope to get more in by launch. If not, don't worry. Um, over time, you're going to see that list grow, 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 right? To, to more and more um, examples and more, maybe even more complex examples as well. Yeah. And some planned middleware integration, right? So um, not just Red Hat SSO, but how do we easily, you know, interoperate with some of these other products like the JBoss Message Queue and, and Router, right? That's a part of a part of that product. JBoss Data Grid, right? Jaeger, I mentioned, Fuse, three scale API management, right? There's a whole bunch of products that we have in the Red Hat middleware that we just want to provide, you know, out of the box. It just works examples all running um, on, on OpenShift, right? And uh, that's the uh, end of kind of the presentation and I'd be happy to take any additional questions. Well there's there's a couple in the that that then go on. We we went a little long, but um and John Osborne and uh, Michelle have been asking um good questions. Um and, and one of them is um and I think there was a little confusion when you launched whether you were launching just to OpenShift online or just locally. But if you had can one of the deployment tar targets be enterprise OCB cluster instead of you know um, the other two, have you tweaked it out for that? Oh, excellent question. So um, if it's running in OpenShift, if, if, if that launch experience is running in as a service, so I mentioned the URL developersredhat.com slash launch, um, which isn't live yet, uh, or shouldn't be, um, then um, you'll typically deploy to one of the online um, online services, um, online starter or online pro. Um, although you can download the zip example locally, right, and play with it locally, and then later decide if I want to deploy it to OpenShift Online. Um, I could also take that launch experience um, that you saw running uh, and run it, install it locally inside of Minishift and just run it inside of Minishift. Um, you might be able to do that with OCP as well, but we haven't uh, done a full like suite of testing with that, right? There might be permissions that you might have to enable for for launch to run in, in, uh, inside of OCP within in, within your environment. So we haven't fully done that, um, but definitely provide me feedback, uh, jklingen at redhat.com, right? And if this is something that you would like to see running inside of your environment, right? Um, so that you could leverage this and deploy it inside of your environment, um, you know, let me know. In fact, one idea that we have is, well, let's let our customers add to that list of use cases so they can define their own that are specific to their environment so that they can then go ahead and do this, right, so within their environment. And mm -hmm. If the code um, for the launch is in GitHub, which I, I think it is, um, they could always fork it and tweak it um, specifically for what they need to use on their enterprise clusters as well. Or is yeah. that not? You could do that. Well, so so we again we haven't tested that, right? So if, if you test that there and you find issues, um, then send a pull request, right? Um, so if you're going to fork it, send us pull requests with 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 any fixes that you've got. Um, at a minimum, uh, uh, here's whether you're running in mini shift or online as a service, what you have in your project is going to get forked to your GitHub account, right? So what you could do is take that out of your GitHub account, clone it locally. Right, or you download the zip directly, like I mentioned during the demo. Now you have it on your desktop. Now all you have to do is OC log into my OCP account and just say Maven fabricate colon deploy dash P OpenShift. Uh, it'll se select the OpenShift profile. It'll it'll deploy to your OCP account, right? I do. Uh, I've actually done that internally here at Red Hat, right? Um, it's just the actual UI and the wizard steps, right? Um, aren't kind of tested in uh, OCP. We've done some kind of nominal testing of actually running the examples themselves inside of OCP, right? So you'll still be able to run those inside of your OCP in your environment. Okay. Some of the other ones might be hard, like SSO and stuff like that might be a little bit harder, but you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the CRUD example you could probably do as long as you have the resource, um, the resources in your account to do that. And the only other comment um, outside of that, because we've run a little bit over, line, over time, but that's quite okay. Um, 
was you were asking for feedback on undertow and someone had mentioned that undertow is basically the most important and most popular embedded container in, in spring boot in the entire spring boot community so support for that would be sounds like it would be a key thing to to, to try and get there at some yeah. point so 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 who mentioned that uh john osborne who i think is um a red hatter um okay get that right we can reach out to him um but we'll, right. we'll see what we can do it so um we are about seven minutes over time so i'm gonna there aren't any other questions i'm gonna give everybody going once going twice um john um, is definitely available for you to ask questions and we will put the links to these things and many more um in a blog post shortly on blog.openshift.com but it will go up on the youtube um channel uh, probably in a day or two um, at the most. So thanks again, John, for taking the time to do this and explain this. And um, we'll look forward to seeing more um, runtimes um, added into this as well. And uh, we'll see maybe what we can do also is work with you guys to do a survey of the OpenShift Commons mailing list to find out what else people are interested in seeing and getting added in. That probably be helpful information. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care, guys.